Our scripture today is from Luke 1, 57 to 63 and 76 to 80. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no John among your relatives who has that name. They made signs to the father to find out what he would like to name the child, and he asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of, his, of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. May the Lord add his blessing to the understanding of your word. Amen. Thank you for the reading of that great word. I want to thank those who attended the organ concert with me on November 20th. Like Paul said, I have shared not only the gospel with you, but I have shared my life and myself, and it was a, a, a treat to see you there. We have these lovely portraits of Christ going up uh, in the North X. We want you to take a few minutes and study them and look at them. Thank David for our new lovely um, framed uh, piece on Jesus Christ. This is the time of the year when we focus on Jesus. He was a baby, but we know he grew to be a man. And uh, we have a little time between service to really gather around those uh, images and conversate, can I say, uh, what might be in the mind of the artist as each artist has painted Jesus in their own uh, imagination as they see Jesus. So it's a wonderful thing, and I'd love to see some uh, get, uh, lively conversation. I've had some already this morning. Um, I'm going to be, uh, I got my ticket for the Maryland Choral Society, and uh, those are wonderful events. I've been to two, so you don't want to miss that. And we welcome all of our visitors today, those who are going to be with us at one, and family members that have come. What a joy on this Advent, the second Sunday in Advent. What a great joy it is indeed for me to be able to be back with you and to stand here in your presence, remembering uh, Mary's great Magnificat, O oh, magnify the Lord, with me. It was a beautiful word that she gave. And this great scripture, thank you, Elder, for reading it. Uh, I'd like to just say that the first Christmas that took place was not the birth of Jesus. Well, not the first Christmas. The beginning of the Christmas story is not at the birth of Jesus. It's at the birth of another baby. And the first pregnancy was not Mary's, but it was her cousin's Elizabeth. And Elizabeth um, was three months pregnant when Mary went to visit her. And I love this scene of when these two mothers get together, one with an immaculate conception and one with a miraculous conception. Because you see, Elizabeth had been barren all those years. Zachariah couldn't believe when the angel Gabriel came to him and said that his wife was going to bring forth a child. He doubted it. So the angel shut his mouth, and he did not speak for nine months. <laughs> then, you know, God just didn't want any bad and vibes around John the Baptist. <laughs> Oh, you may call him John the Baptizer. I heard something funny. That doesn't mean he was Baptist. <laughs> the Baptist alone can't claim him, so sometimes we say John the Baptizer. Uh, 
they had, had tried to have children and couldn't. And since she had no child in her youth, they just didn't think it was possible that in her old age she could have a child. Now, Zachariah should not have doubted because God had done this before, right? I know you're sitting thinking of another person who had a significant child in old age. Somebody tell me who that was. Sarah, absolutely. She didn't believe either. It was so preposterous, the Bible says she laughed out loud. And that's what Isaac means, you know, because his mom laughed, he got that name, Isaac. Yes, the first miracle of Christmas is that Elizabeth is great with child. It seems impossible, uh, but we know that with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen, amen. This is the beginning of the Christmas story. And you know, we don't give John enough attention because Jesus said no greater prophet ever lived than John. And Jesus preached the same message of John. What was John preaching? Repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus went out to preach, what did he preach? The same thing. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And I remember this about John. John was the first person to call Jesus out, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so why did John know this so well and was so ready to declare him the Messiah? Because his mother taught him. Because Elizabeth, even before he was born, Elizabeth had said the same thing. Yes, this is a sign of what God has done in the world. A world that is empty and barren will soon be full of new life. A world that is longing for a new future will soon hear the cry of a newborn child. The longing of the world for a savior will soon be fulfilled. This child of Elizabeth is preparing the way for God to come into the world. This child. The Christmas story is six years old, I'm mean, sorry, six months old. Six months later, Mary hears the angel Gabriel, six months after um, John's, the angel came to Gabriel, it comes to Mary. Mary hears the angel Gabriel whisper in her ears. I had an extensive Madonna and child collection, over 200 artifacts, paintings, cards, jewelry, lace. I had Madonna and child everywhere that I it did give away. But you see, I had both of my girls um, in January. So I was very pregnant at Christmas time. So I related to Mary. And many of us as women today and as mothers especially can relate to these two women, Mary and Elizabeth. Yes, Mary is told that she also is going to have a child. That's the second miracle of Christmas. The first is the pregnancy of Elizabeth. The second, the pregnancy of Mary, because she's a young virgin. And she may have been 13 or 14 young. Back in those days, that was not so exceptional. It's very exceptional to us now. But I have a picture of five generations of my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and my great-great-grandmother who I knew she died when I was eight, and we would go visit. So you know, in certain times back when, people started their families young. Some of them had their children. Some of my paternal ancestors had their children at 14 also. So we uh, raise our eyebrow, eyebrow at that now, but it wasn't so unusual back in that day, amen. But this is not going to be an ordinary child that Mary's having. This is God's son, Emmanuel, the very presence of God in the world. Mary is to be the bearer of God's child. And as soon as Mary finds out she's going to give birth to God's son, she runs to guess who? Her cousin Elizabeth. And I think we all know why. Who else? is going to believe her <laughs> when she says, I'm pregnant and it's God's fault. 
Most people would have dismissed her as saying something crazy out of her mind. Get this child some help. But she knew Elizabeth and only Elizabeth would understand because Elizabeth had her own good news. And Elizabeth knows as soon as Mary enters the room that she's got great news. That's what the word gospel means, good news. This is the best news she's ever heard, right? Because she says the baby leaps up in her womb. John, who's inside of her, leapt up in her womb when hearing Mary's voice, when Mary enters the room. And it says, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth knows the great thing God is doing in the world through Mary. And it is Elizabeth who first says, blessed are you, Mary. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. I love this. One woman encouraging another woman. Sometimes when men are silent, women have to encourage each other. Don't we, sisters? Can I get an amen? These two women are supporting each other. They're encouraging it. They're on a similar journey in God. She says, blessed are you, Mary, because you believe that God will fulfill God's promises. Blessed are you, Mary. Both these children are God anointed, God appointed, and given a very special assignment. Yes, they cannot stop proclaiming the amazing work of God in each other's lives. It seems as though Elizabeth is preparing Mary, just like John will prepare the way for Jesus. You see the parallel there? So Mary joins Elizabeth in song. Mary, uplifted by Elizabeth's joy, she starts her own song, My Soul Magnifies the Lord. And Mary sings as well, God has done great things for me. That was what she sang, God has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He has lifted the lowly. He has filled the hungry. He sent the rich away empty. He has kept his promises. This is the first Christmas song. I love the Christmas music. Oh, yeah. December 1. It's on the radio. It's out. It's in my car. I've got several playlists of Christmas music. And I play it all the time because it just seems like it's so beautiful and the season is so short. So we love the music, but when you leave today, remember what the first Christmas song was. God has done great things for me. Great things, great things. God has done great things for me. Elizabeth and Mary stand at the beginning of the Christmas story, holding their bellies that are full of new life, singing at the top of their lungs. These women are the bearers of good news, literally within their own bodies. They hold the promise of God's future for the world. They hold one child who would prepare the way and one child who would be the way. This is the beginning of the Christmas story, and it begins with unexpected pregnancy of two unlikely women, one who thought she was too old and one who is a virgin. It's interesting that the beginning of the Christmas story starts with these two women. The Zachariah's lips are sealed and shut until John is born. And also, Joseph never says a word, at least not in the book of Luke. And if he does say anything at all, Luke doesn't tell us what he says. Only the women have a voice here. Yes, isn't it interesting? Christmas began with women, and so did Easter. Have you often thought about that? The women were first to the tomb on Easter morning. And it is the women who are the first to understand and grasp and participate in the coming of the Lord. That's what Advent is, waiting for the coming of the Lord. Both the first coming, and he already came, amen? And the second coming, he's coming back again. Don't forget that part. Advent is about both. Sometimes we lean way over about the birth of Jesus and we forget about, oh, but he didn't just come once. He's coming again. Remember that during this particular season. 
Yes, God enters the world. He doesn't always come to those who have power and a voice and opportunity to speak, but rather he comes into the world where he is needed. Someone said something that I really appreciate. God sees and God sends. I want to park there for a little while because I want you to know whatever your condition this morning, God sees. That's the first thing. That's what Haggai said out in the wilderness. Remember Bible scholars, God is the one who sees me, El Roy. He sees me. God sees and he sends. He sends help. So whatever you're going through, if it's hard, God will send you help. He did it in my life. He's done it in the life of others. Be assured that just as he sent and came himself to save the world from sin, he's still sending help to anybody who needs help. Yes, God came to the lowly. God came to people who have no voice. God comes to what? Give them a song to sing. I like that phrase, my heart sings. Christmas makes my heart sing. That's what God does. He makes our heart sing. Yes. Those who have no hope, he gives them joy for tomorrow. He comes to the lowly. He lifts them up to a place of honor. He comes to those who are older, gives them life more abundantly. So those of us that are in later stages of life, God is still sending us all that we need and more than we can hope, ask, or imagine. Hallelujah. God lifts the meek and the lowly. He fills the needy and the hungry. That's what Christmas is about. It's about the preferential option for the poor. God said, I'm coming to lift the poor, to send the rich away and to feed those who are needy, to heal the sick and wounded, to save the lost and lonely. God comes to save. God comes to save. God comes to save. That's what Jesus means, the one who saves. This is the Christmas story. And Christmas is about miracles. So don't give up on your dreams today. You know, when children are asked what they want for Christmas, uh, they don't hold back. They dream big. They ask big, right? <laughs> they ask for things that sometimes are far-fetched. Then parents try their best, sometimes going beyond their means, to have an item requested under that tree. Yes, amen. It is the story of God, a God who comes to change the world. And if we listen, we can almost hear the women singing about it now. God has done great things. He's shown strength with his arm, scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, brought down the powerful, lifted up the lowly, filled the hungry, sent the rich empty away. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. This is the prayer of Zechariah. And so today, my heart is singing. So let us sing along. This was Miriam's song <laughs> as they went through the Red Sea. This is Deborah's song when she won the battle. God has done great things. It's, it's several times in the Bible, but today especially, it's Elizabeth's and Mary's song. And so we're going to ask you to join in saying it. There are some words right there in the bulletin, and we're going to Lisa and Kathy are going to sing through one verse, and I want you to join in and sing on the, on the other verses. Thank you, David. Sing along now. He has made a way for me. Made a way. Great things. He has done great things for me. He has made a way for me. Yes, he has. done great things for 
him at this time of the year because hasn't he done something great in your life? Oh yes, thank you. Thank you for helping me preach this sermon because it's a miracle that we're here. It's a miracle how far our children and grandchildren have gone. It's a miracle we can worship in a land where freedom is one of its greatest claims. I thank God today I am free to worship God. No chains are binding me. Hallelujah. I am free. And that means that a change is coming. Something big is getting ready to happen, y'all. <laughs> so let us be on this journey to Bethlehem. May the waiting room be our preparation. May watchfulness be our guiding star. Take time during this season to hold a baby. Take time and look up. Something big is coming. And when it comes, sing as loud as you can. He has done great things for me. Amen. 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 And now I ask, what big thing are you looking for this year right now? If it's hope, love, joy, or peace, then Jesus is the one you're looking for because he is the way to hope, love, joy, and peace. Each of these candles represent and so I invite you now, as we sing the hymn of self-dedication, to come forward here in the sanctuary, or if you're on Zoom or Facebook, let someone know that you come to adore him. The Bible says, confess with your mouth that he's Lord, believe in your heart that he, God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. That's what the name Jesus means, the one who saves. Confess and believe you shall be saved. Let us come as we sing. <laughs> 